Good morning and welcome to this year's Virtual Founders Day Celebration Assembly. For those students who don't know, Founders Day, as the name suggests, is when we acknowledge and celebrate the founding and birthplace of Hitchin Boys School. In these uncertain times that we live in at present, it is always nice to reflect and to, to look back on the past. But how much do you know about Hitchin Boys School and its history? What parts of the school that you walk through on a daily basis existed back then? And what traditions do we still follow to this day? So when and how did it all start? Hitchin Boys School was founded on the 25th of July 1639 by John Mattock to teach and instruct and train up the inhabitants of Hitchin. Originally, it was an old free school situated not where we sit today, but on the top of Tyler Street, which was later named Tilehouse Street. Initially, all teaching was centred around the Reformation, with free school not meaning no payment, but free from any religious constraints. However, the rigours of the English Civil War put strain on the teaching at the school, especially as boys were more inclined to watch Oliver Cromwell pass through Hitchin than to concentrate on the finer points of Latin and English grammar. Throughout the next 237 years, Hitchin Free School had 15 headmasters. However, due to insufficient funding for renovation and refurbishment, the school temporarily closed in 1876. Over the next 13 years, the trustees never abandoned hope that John Mattock's dream would once again become reality to benefit the education of the children of Hitchin. Eventually, in 1889, Frederick Seaborn, who was a rich and influential Quaker, bought a large mansion and its accompanying land and set up the Hitchin Grammar School on the same site as we are on today. Hence, on the 1st of May 1889, Hitchin Grammar School opened its doors and accepted both boys and girls. However, as the main school as we know it today had not yet been built, all the lessons took place in woodlands. At this time, the people of Hitchin were not ready for a co-educational grammar school, so plans were made for the girls to occupy Woodlands House and enter by the front door, having the rear garden for their recreation. The boys would enter the old stable yard by the coach gate and recreation confined to the schoolyard. Both would by arrangement use the plantation for a recreational exercise. Compulsory education was still young at that time and Hitchin was still a very small market town. Many people saw manual work as a better alternative to written education and initially there were only 35 pupils at the school. This map of Hitchin illustrates just how small Hitchin was at that time. Parents often removed pupils if discipline was implemented. Pupil homework was frequently not completed and attendance was really, really poor. Having already owned the land, expansion of the new school took place almost immediately at the meagre cost of three and a half thousand pound. And a stone tablet was placed at the entrance to the main school, which we can still see today, along with many of its original buildings and fittings. This is a picture of the front of the school where the staff now park their cars and where the minibuses are also parked. In 1908, Hitchin Girls School departed to the new premises on the top of Windmill Hill, leaving the whole of Bancroft Free for Hitchin Boys School. By 1925, the house names were given to the names of Mattock, Pearson, Skinner and Radcliffe after John Mattock, Joseph Pearson, Ralph Skinner and the Radcliffe family, all of whom had been school benefactors. And by 1926, pupil numbers had grown to 265 and has been increasing ever since. The next major development in 1929 was the acquiring of the Blue Cross Field, commonly known as the top rugby pitch and AstroTurf. And it also soon became very apparent that further development was needed as the number of pupils were steadily increasing. No different to the present day, as the numbers per year group coming into the school have increased to 210, so we've had to a look into the need for expansion and the development and this is a picture of the new uh, pavilion uh, being built last summer. 
the governors realized that large scale construction was required, but was very much dependent on the closing of the public right of way that ran through the school fields and eventually funded a brand new pathway along the edge of the playing fields, eventually to become Elmside Walk. However, the public had always enjoyed this right of way through the school and were not inclined to change their habits and the locals still used the school grounds to walk through. A fact documented in a poem in the school chronicle. And when they found the door was locked, they pulled and pushed and kicked and knocked. And when they found the door was shut, they tried to turn the handle, but the lords had passed out this dec decree that all the fish ponds roadies be debarred from entrance by the gate because we'd found them been of late. A stream of strangers passing through, unauthorised, what could we do? But shut the gates and bide the storms, because they thought they had the right to enter by Fishbond's route, and wander through the school on foot or bike. We stuck a bill to say, you know right here, so go away. So consequently, in 1934, the gates were locked during the school hours. And this is no different than the procedures we have in place to this very day. This large scale development and construction is, in essence, what we have today and numerous buildings are still in use. This is a picture of School House, which now houses Reaper Graphics and the Finance Office, to name but two. The school dining room was situated in what we know as the school library today. And the main hall hasn't changed that much at all. Although the science labs look slightly dated. In school, a house point scheme was established with only deductions seemingly of a point, not in additions. So on to today and Founders Day. The first Founders Day took place on the 25th of July, 1932, exactly 300 years after John Mattock had given the deeds to the land where Hitchin Free School was built. Since then, in many ways, Founders Day has remained unchanged. Originally, the whole school marched in procession down Brand Street, High Street and the marketplace to St Mary's Church. However, in the 1960s, due to the increase in traffic, this was discontinued and the pupils used the footpaths to reach the church. The boys always entered the church via the south porch, attributed to the Mattock family. As both Hitchin Boys School and Hitchin Girls School still share the service, the number of pupils have outgrown St Mary's Church and in 1967, due to a lack of space, the junior school, what we know as years 7 to 10, was squeezed out. Since the 1960s, Founders Day service is celebrated on the last Friday in June to mark the end of compulsory education for all year 11 and the final leaving day for all year 13 students at both Hitchin Boys School and Hitchin Girls School. Additionally, for Hitchin Boys School, it has become a tradition that the school swimming gala takes place in the afternoon of Founders Day. From its very first beginnings, music and sport were considered an important aspect of the school, with musical interludes being performed at the Christmas concerts and as the entertainment that accompanied Speech Day and Founders Day. This usually comprised of some choral singing and other performers on the piano and violin. The school sports day was also a popular attraction, as well as a great fundraiser for the school as the entire town of Hitchin was invited. Boys could enter as many races as they liked for a small fee which went to the school. Alongside the serious athletic events, there were also novelty events to keep spectators amused, such as boxing situated in the main hall. You can just about see in the background the main hall balcony with pupils looking down and supporting. And one of the first ever house events to take place was the tug of war. Hitchin Boys School has always been a forward thinking school whose popularity still remains high throughout the town of Hitchin and beyond. A fact demonstrated in how oversubscribed we are as a school each year. As in 1889, the school is expanding as pupil numbers increase with demand. And I wonder, having looked back at the history of the school, how many of the present day buildings, the new J block, the pavilion, will still be around in the next century. One thing I can guarantee though, 
is that although some of the buildings could disappear and quite a few of the staff, the traditions and ethos of the school will remain ingrained and be true to John Mattock's initial aim, which was to teach and instruct and train up the inhabitants of Hitchin. Thank you for listening and stay safe.